Megalopolises in the U.S. are extremely interesting. Figuring out how to define them and where they are is a subject I'm incredibly interested in. Places like the Northeast Megalopolis have so much history behind them, while places like the Texas Triangle are on the rise and currently attempting to make a name for themselves. Today, though, I wanted to talk about a more historic one that isn't necessarily forming itself into a megalopolis, but instead has so many different cities with different stories, some declining and some growing at really nice rates. This is the Great Lakes Mega Region. Before the video starts, though, make sure you do subscribe to the channel. We make a lot of megalopolis videos like this, and the plan is to cover every single megalopolis in the country. So if you're interested in that kind of content, just click the subscribe button. Thank you. Let's start by getting some things out of the way. What exactly is the Great Lakes Mega Region, and why don't we call it a megalopolis? Well, let's start by exploring the second thing, because it also helps us find exactly where the mega region is. So the definition of a megalopolis is continuous populated area stretching hundreds of miles between multiple connected cities. The best example of this is obviously the Northeast Megalopolis, where you can go all the way from Washington DC to Boston without leaving a generally populated area once. That's over 400 miles of connected cities. Another example would be the Florida Megalopolis, which though it's less traditional, is still pretty obviously a megalopolis. If you make a squiggly line through the state, you can get over 550 miles of just different cities connected with each other to form a megalopolis. Now those are what I would consider to be the only two actual megalopolises in the country, but you also have the southeast megalopolis, stretching 400 miles between Atlanta and Raleigh. And though it doesn't really follow under the exact definition of what we call a megalopolis, you can still use the term to describe it. That's always been my logic when referring to places like Cascadia, the Front Range, and the Texas Triangle. But that's not what the Great Lakes mega region is. The main difference we see is that there is actually very rural area in between these cities, and even though they're pretty close together, you still find farmlands and areas that you just cannot consider to be a megalopolis. So now that we have that out of the way, let's try and figure out the boundaries of the Great Lakes mega region. Now since this term is so loose, there are a few different valid ways you can look at it. If you want a more extended definition, we could go from Minneapolis through the whole eastern Midwest all the way to Rochester, New York taking up the north half of Illinois plus most of Indiana and Ohio. This would put its total population above even that of the northeast megalopolis, but it would also require including a lot of really rural areas in between the farthest extended cities. You could also go for a more centralized mega region, only including from Madison, Wisconsin to Buffalo, New York, including just Lake Erie and the north parts of Ohio and Indiana, as well as the southern part of Michigan and then Chicago. Now, if I wanted to call this video a megalopolis, then this is what I would be referring to, since all of these cities are really close together, but they still aren't connected. So if we're going to talk about a mega region, we need something in between these two ideas. And that's where the map I'm going to be using in this video comes into play. So what I've got is the southeast region of Wisconsin, then stretching down to Rockford before taking a turn to Indianapolis, and then down to Louisville in the far south before it starts going north through Ohio and Pittsburgh, and then up to Buffalo and into Canada. In Canada, I have the southern portion of the peninsula there with Toronto, Hamilton, and London, then into Windsor and Detroit. Finally, I have the whole southern part of Michigan included before it reaches Lake Michigan and we come full circle. Everything inside of these boundaries I consider to be a part of the mega region. So now that we have all of that in order, we can go through the cities one by one and give a brief rundown of them. Starting with Madison, Wisconsin. So Madison is one of my favorite cities in the entire country. The whole city is built according to Lake Mendota and Lake Monona with the downtown located in the isthmus between the two. Madison has two main vocal points, with one being the capital area built around Wisconsin State Capitol building. The road layout is basically built according to this building, which makes a super interesting city. The other vocal point is the University of Wisconsin, located on the west side of the downtown. Both of these things come together to create a vibrant and exciting and a young city. Madison had a population of 19,000 in 1900, improving to 96,000 in 1950, and finally all the way up to 270,000 in 2020. And the city is seeing pretty good increases since its census. Next up we have Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is the main city in the state, and overall is very different from its counterpart Madison. Milwaukee is significantly bigger and more so identifies with the Rust Belt of America. There's a lot of fading industry in the city, and you'll find a good amount of abandoned warehouses and empty lots in the worst part of the city. With that though, Milwaukee is actually a lot better than people think, and has a lot of really nice areas. The population was 285,000 in 1900, improving to 637,000 in 1950, and then decreasing to 577,000 in 2020. 
meaning it lost 60,000 residents since then and hasn't gained population in a census since 1960. Next up, we have Chicago, Illinois, arguably the biggest city in the entire mega region, depending on how you define Toronto. Chicago is the lifeline of the Midwest, holding one of the most powerful central business districts in the country, as well as probably the most vibrant lakeshore. Chicago historically has gotten a pretty bad rap for being a crime-ridden wasteland, but it's actually become a pretty awesome and interesting city in my personal opinion. In 1900, the population was 1.7 million, then going up to 3.6 million in 1950, but back down to 2.7 million in 2020, which means in the past 70 years, it's been losing population slightly at a negative 24% rate. Next up, we move to the West, where we find Indianapolis, a city that a lot of people really don't know that much about. It's obviously home to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, most people know that, but it also has a really cool downtown with Market Street, the Soldiers and Sailors Monument, and this whole group of cool stuff to the north of that. Indianapolis had a population of 169,000 in 1900, improving to 427,000 in 1950, and now 888,000 in 2020, meaning it's actually a ton bigger than most people think. Next up, we have Louisville, Kentucky, the southernmost point in the mega region and home to the Louisville Slugger Factory. When considering declining industrial cities, people never include Louisville in with the rest of the Midwest. But the city has some pretty bad areas that I think a lot of people never talk about. It's not perfect by any means. Louisville had a population of 204,000 in 1900, improving to 369,000 in 1950 and 633,000 in 2020. This means the city has had really nice growth compared to others we see in the mega region. Next up, we move to Ohio, where we start with Cincinnati, a city that does not get enough credit for the amount of effect it has on the state. Cincinnati is a pretty hilly city right on the Ohio River, with two Riverside stadiums for their major league teams. The population was 325,000 in 1900, improving to 504,000 in 1950, and then back down to 309,000 in 2020. So the city is fairly small and declining in population at this point, but the metropolitan area has been growing steadily, and at this point is around 2.25 million total. Now we move just to the north for Dayton. At this point, these two cities' overall metropolitan areas are basically connected, but the main cities still have pretty obvious boundaries. Dayton has really struggled as a city, and has definitely fallen victim to the decline of the Rust Belt. In 1900, the population was 85,000, improving to 243,000 in 1950, and falling back down to 137,000 in 2020 meaning it has declined in population pretty rapidly since 1960. Next, we stay in Ohio, where we find its capital, Columbus. Now, Columbus is a pretty underrated city, in my opinion. It has cheap housing prices because of its location in Ohio, but the crime is relatively decent, and the city does not have that much wrong with it. Sure, it isn't the most flashy area, but it's a really decent area to live. The population was 125,000 in 1900, improving to 375,000 in 1950, then making a pretty large jump to 905,000 in 2020. Columbus has become a really large city in recent years. Now we move to the northeast corner where we find Cleveland, one of the best examples of a declining Rust Belt city. The area at one point was one of America's most important cities, but it slowly declined to become what some call a smaller, less awful Detroit. The population was 381,000 in 1900, booming all the way to 876,000 in 1950, and then sadly dropping down under its 1900s total, all the way to 372,000 in 2020. Next we have Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a really interesting city tucked into the confluence of the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers, boasting one of the top skylines in America, and personally probably the best I've ever visited. And that's over Chicago, don't get mad at me, I'm right. Pittsburgh had a population of 321,000 in 1900, improving to 677,000 in 1950, and falling back down to 302,000 in 2020. Despite the population decline in Pittsburgh, it's managed to diversify its economy and has become a lot better as a city in recent years. It's actually a nice place. Next up, we have Buffalo, New York, where we move to what I call the northern portion of the mega region. So Buffalo struggles from the same type of Rust Belt decline that the other cities have seen. And especially in areas just east of the downtown, the city is evidently not doing all that well. Buffalo brings us a new struggle with winter weather. With it being placed at the east end of Lake Erie, it sees a lot of lake effect snow, getting several very severe winter storms every single year. In 1900, the population was 352,000, moving up to a respectable 580,000 in 1950, and then back down to 278,000 in 2020. The city has a lot of improving to do for sure. Next, we move to Canada to find Toronto. 
this is an underrated area in the megalopolis because this region of canada has a ton of people and a lot of the time people don't really think about that toronto is the biggest city in its country boasting a population of 2.8 million in 2020 up from 1.2 million in 1950 and 238,000 in 1900. It has become one of North America's most influential cities. Now throughout this region in Canada, we find a few other major cities with Hamilton, Kitchener, London, and Guelph, among others. All of these cities boast populations well above 100,000, but there isn't a ton unique and different about all of these smaller cities in Ontario, so I'm going to choose to save time and skip over them all the way to Detroit, a once great city that has severely fallen off to complete urban desolation, and some of the worst blight in the entire country. At this point, the city is just too big for its own good, with so much population decline that the city just cannot afford to upkeep the large area in Gulf. The city had a population of 285,000 in 1900, booming all the way to 1.8 million in 1950, where we then find one of the craziest population declines in the country's history. Because over the next 70 years, Detroit lost 1.2 million residents and fell all the way down to 640k in 2020. Now you can see why the city just cannot afford to upkeep the entire city lines. Because Detroit was built for three times the residents it currently has. Next up we have our final city to go over in this video, Grand Rapids. So Grand Rapids I think is super underrated. It's located in Michigan which isn't necessarily known for having great cities, but its struggles are a lot less serious than the rest of the state. It's an overall nice place to be with relatively cheap housing to go along with that, which is exactly what I value in a city personally. The population was 87,000 in 1900, improving to 176,000 in 1950 and 198,000 in 2020, meaning it's seen pretty steady increases throughout its history. So those are the major cities I wanted to talk about in the Great Lakes mega region. Now I wanted to go over how the Great Lakes have affected and created these cities. So, a lot of the time, people just don't really realize how crazy and important these lakes are. It's the largest freshwater system in the entire world. It's the primary water source for more than 40 million people, and 20% of the entire world's freshwater is located in these lakes. This is something we don't see anywhere else on Earth, and they're so incredibly important to the country. Green Bay, Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo, Toronto are all located on a Great Lake. South Bend, Fort Wayne, Grand Rapids, Saginaw, Lansing, and Appleton are all located on rivers connected to the Great Lakes. Chicago has a canal connecting Lake Michigan to the Mississippi River, in turn basically completing water travel throughout the country. Historically, these lakes were so incredibly important in the process of transporting goods from the Atlantic Ocean into the continental interior. As well as that, I did want to quickly give everyone a meteorology class, because I think lake effect snow is incredibly interesting. Cities like Buffalo and Grand Rapids especially see a lot of lake effect snow, but the entire Great Lakes area sees it to an extent. Basically, when cold air travels across a large body of water like the Great Lakes, it will gain water vapor from the lake, and as that water vapor condenses, it releases heat and causes clouds to develop. When the air gets cold enough, ice crystals form and moves the clouds to the downwind shores. This means usually since wind moves west to east, cities with a Great Lake to the west are going to see a lot of lake effect snow. Although that doesn't mean it's uncommon to see it all throughout this lake region. Finally, I wanted to talk about the future of the Great Lakes mega region. Because ever since 1950, cities have been hit or miss on how they go. Some places like Indianapolis and Columbus in the more southern part of the mega region haven't really struggled with population decline or economic decline. But places like Detroit or Cleveland have had a lot of trouble dealing with the decline of their cities. Places like Chicago and Pittsburgh are somewhat in the middle and have been able to diversify their economies and recover from the decay of the former industries. I do believe this region as a whole has a fairly bright future. Certain cities have shown it's not impossible to redefine who you are and adapt to the change in America. And though it's obviously easier for a city like Chicago to recover than it is for a place like Detroit, I still think in 20 to 30 years from now, these cities will be in a very different place, since we're already seeing improvements in the most recent censuses. But at the end of the day, I don't fully know what I'm talking about, and it's really just up to these cities in this region to fully redefine itself and become the once great mega region we all knew. Thanks for watching. Thank you to the members this week, Wolflink, Carport, Steiner Swine, Florida Jake, Philip Gertz, Somnom Woods, Big Pasty, Stormy Knight, Nikita Martinoff, KMS162, Haystack, Benjamin Whiting, Ryan Devins, Oz of the Wolf, Jake Holloway, JL, Jeremy Carport, Dominic Psyche, Rosebud4, and Bryson. I appreciate you guys so much. You absolutely help me as a person, and I just really appreciate what you're doing for the channel. 
If you want to become a channel member, the link is in the description below, as well as the join button next to the subscribe button. All this money goes straight into my college savings, so you're genuinely just helping me out as a person. I'm not going to spend any of this stuff on dumb purchases. It's all going straight into my future. Thank you.